So welcome everyone. Thank you for taking the time to join us and be part of this conversation today. We've come together today, virtually, to listen to voices of access and disability in higher education. Our intention for today's panel is to define access, inclusion, and belonging, as well as identify barriers within our academic spaces and educational institutions that directly and indirectly threaten inclusion. Our goal is to contribute to the conversation around the importance of broadening our understanding of access and disability as a justice-centered issue. We come together today as disabled folks and accomplices to address and challenge ableism in our institutions, acknowledging that access is a united effort because the outcomes do and will impact all of us. My name is Amanda, my pronouns are she and her, and I'll be moderating, moderating this conversation today. I join you today as a second year occupational therapy student at the University of Alberta and a UBC alumnus from the Integrated Sciences Program. Uh, today I am wearing a purplish gray t-shirt. Um, I am an East Asian woman. My hair is down and if you're with me in this room it might not be very clear but I've got lots and lots of freckles. <laughs> I'm in front of a dimly lit room. It's yellow and you might see pictures on the walls. So I myself am calling from Treaty 7 today. The traditional territories of the Siksika, Bigani, Gaina, Sutina, and Stony Nakoda nations the Métis Nation, and all people who make their homes in the Treaty 7 region of Southern Alberta. We gratefully acknowledge Creating Accessible Neighborhoods BC, Utown at UBC's Community of Care and Grant, and the UBC Department of Geography's Equity and Diversity Committee for their financial support of this space today. These partners and contributing organizations operate on the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, Stalo, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. As we come to share a virtual space today, access in the academic system occurs alongside and in solidarity with those of Indigenous peoples everywhere to amplify and uplift Indigenous voices and ways of knowing within educational institutions. As a participant, we ask you to consider and reflect on whose land you live, work, and learn. Disability justice and decolonization are inextricably linked in efforts to resist oppressive forces. As we discuss a disability just justice-centered approach to access and education, we also recognize and honor the work that has been done towards decolonizing these shared spaces, providing opportunities for these efforts to grow together. Instead of a set ticket price, we ask that you contribute what you can to the Vancouver Black Therapy and Advocacy Fund and the Black and BC Community Support Fund for COVID-19. Whatever contribution you can afford will go a long way to create safety networks for Black communities facing health and financial hardships due to COVID-19. You can find the link in the chat um, and Rachel has shared that. Okay, so to get a bit of an idea of who's joining us today, we're going to launch a poll uh, of two questions. I will read out the questions and the, um, the options there. So the first question is, what is your role within higher education? The options are undergraduate student, master's student, PhD candidate, faculty, staff, or any other group if you don't see one here that reflects yourself. I think we'll give about another five seconds. And I will end that. We've still got quite a bit of activity. Okay. All right. So I'm not sure if, oh, share results. Okay. So I'm sharing the results here and it looks like about 15% of us are undergraduate students today. The majority here at 28% are master's students. 16% are PhD candidates. 17% are faculty about the same amount, 16% were staff, and 24%, almost a quarter of us, um, identify as a, a group that does not fit into the categories that we provided today. Oh, and there was the other, the other question went out at the same time. I apologize for not reading those, uh, those options. So the second question here is, have you experienced barriers in access and learning spaces? The three options were, yes, I have, no, I have not, and I have witnessed others face barriers to access. Most of us have 
directly experience barriers to access ourselves, coming in at 53%. The second um, highest option was having witnessed others face barriers and access at 41%, and five of us have not. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing that now. Thank you so much for participating in that poll. For more participation or opportunities to participate, the Q&A box will be open throughout the panel um, for any technical issues, as well as for you to pose questions to our panel. We ask that you directly address the speaker in your question, if it's for a specific individual, or address the entire panel in your question as well. You'll be able to see questions that have been asked already and upvote ones that you'd like to have answered. At this time, I'd like to remind the audience that when asking questions, please be precise in the language you choose and avoid using ableist terms. For example, instead of saying crazy, try using ridiculous. Um, and instead of saying tone deaf or blind to, try using ignorant. Let's be mindful of how our common words and phrases can cause harm to others. Okay, I'm happy to kick off today's event, which I've been doing so, um, by introducing our speakers. So today we welcome Mike Prescott here, who is currently a PhD candidate at the Faculty of Rehabilitation Studies at UBC, an experienced community and organizational strategy consultant looking at the gaps between the needs of people with disabilities and the physical designs of spaces. We welcome Canadian scholar, Dr. Lucia Lorenzi, who earned her PhD at UBC, with her research having looked at representations of gendered and sexualized violence in literature and other media. Dr. Lorenzi is an artist, speaker, and has long been vocal in academic spaces she has been part of. We welcome Dr. Juanita Sundberg, an associate professor in the Department of Geography at UBC, whose work seeks to foster conversations between more than human geographies, critical indigenous studies, and critical theories of race and ableism in relation to climate change and extinction in settler colonial societies within the Americas. Finally, we welcome Dr. Heidi Jans, who is both an instructor in the Masters of Educational Technology program at UBC and an adjunct professor with the John Dossiter Health Ethics Center at the University of Alberta. In her other life, she's a writer, playwright, and filmmaker. We're so lucky to have a group that comes from varied spaces across academia, which will work to shape and flavor our conversation today on how each of our speakers' lived experiences are interwoven with their research in race, climate and migrant justice, technology and beyond. I'm now going to invite each speaker to briefly introduce themselves as well as provide a visual description for our audience before we proceed into the first question of our moderated Q&A. All right, Mike, I think that's you. Okay, um, my name is Mike Prescott. Uh, my hair is up, um, both of them. Uh, I'm, I have a light background behind me. I am a um, white male who has a, um, I'm an incomplete paraplegic. I have, uh, as was mentioned, I'm working on my PhD, coming to the very end of it. My focus is on how um, people who use wheel mobility navigate the um, unfamiliar environments and uh, trying to understand accessibility issues from a physical, social, cognitive, and temporal basis. That's all. Wonderful, thank you, Mike. Um, Lucia? Hi everyone, uh, my name is Lucia. I use she, her, hers pronouns. I'm a light-skinned black woman. I have my hair up in a bun. I'm wearing a dark black shirt and gold hoop earrings. And in the background behind me, I'm in a room with a blue wall that has bookshelves and photographs. Um, so yeah, my I'm sort of a, a, a former academic in some ways. Um, I recently did a postdoc at McMaster University and a writer in residence position at SFU. And the majority of my research uh, focuses on sexualized and gendered violence, but I'm also deeply interested in mourning, in how we gather to mourn together, um, and relationality and responsibility. Mm. Thank you, Lucia. Juanita? Hello, everyone. My name is Juanita Sandberg. Um, my pronouns are she, her, hers. Uh, to follow up on the land acknowledgement, I just want to say that I hope that the work that we do today honors uh, the struggles for self-determination of the original peoples of this land. Um, 
I, as for a visual description, I'm a white woman with the occasional Texas accent, if that's part of your repertoire. Um, I am blonde gray white hair, uh, short, glasses, wearing a blue um, turquoise top, and in the background it's white with a white cabinet. There may be the occasional animal that pops into the screen, specifically cats, uh, but potentially a dog as well. Um, I am um, really interested in this conversation today. I've been brought into the conversation, I have to say, um, thanks to uh, Corin, who is a graduate student in my department in geography. And I have been learning a lot from Corin about um, barriers and the ways in which um, many of us are ignorant and really excited about learning more, expanding my repertoire, expanding my capacity to understand and also to acknowledge um, limitations uh, that I bring to the table that I also prefer to keep um, under wraps because of all of the issues that we're here to talk about today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anita. And Heidi. I'm Heidi Jams. Hi, I'm Heidi Jams. My pronouns are she and her. I'm I'm a white woman who has cerebral palsy. I'm a wheelchair user. I'm I'm in my bedroom slash office. Beige pinky walls behind me. And the other word that you hear is my age, Tyler, who's echoing my speech. And I'm excited to be here today. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you to all of our speakers for introducing themselves. We're now going to jump into our first question. Um, and that is, what is your personal definition of access? Um, and what does access look or feel like to you? And we'll start, we'll start with Mike today. Okay. Um, well, I kind of have a, a rather narrow focus on it related to my studies. So I kind of have two definitions and I'll just focus on what I'm doing in terms of my research. It's looking at it, as I, I think I mentioned briefly, um, looking at the social, physical, uh, cognitive and temporal um, barriers in, in uh, the environments that make it difficult to get from one place to the next. And I think that um, when I look, talk about what access is, it's really scale and context dependent. So what's access at uh, when you're thinking about tools that you're using for your hands versus how what access means for a broader community may be very different. And uh, another thing that's come out of my research is uh, access looking at barriers and facilitators, but also burden. And in terms of, it might be that it takes more effort, it takes more time or more money to accomplish what you want to do in order to um, be able to fully participate in, in the community. So I think those are the sort of the core elements that I have. I will say that one area that I struggle with is universal design, which often comes up in uh, discussions of, of access. And I, I, I have, I'm kind of the one of the people in the department that I am um, an, an academic in that always cringes when I hear about universal design as it relates to, again, my area more at the urban planning level, um, having no metrics, almost no empirical evidence. And so um, 
I, I kind of struggle with that. Maybe my my mind will be changed over the years uh, as it as it um, um, uh, evolves. So here we go. Thank you, Mike. Alicia, go ahead. Um, so I guess in defining access, I want to situate myself a little bit more. So. I'm a queer black woman living with chronic illness and also a brain injury from a concussion that I had a couple of years ago. And so for me, the definition of access is very much bound up in multiple identities. Um, I've been thinking a lot about access, obviously its relationship to colonialism. And so one of the things that I think about in terms of access is not just who, you know, we talk about being in the room or who can be in the room, but I'm also thinking about who is refusing to be there because they know that access to a space does not mean that that space is a just, a loving, a productive space. And so I think in terms of access, I think of course about physical space, because that's something that we do need to think about, but also social, the social relations that govern how we use that space and what happens in that space. So for me, as, you know, as somebody who has been trained um, through community in Black studies, that wasn't a part of my formal education in my PhD, that access is tied up in questions of abolition, of transformative justice and trying to think, yes, about equality and inclusion and diversity, but beyond, beyond those terms. Juanita, go ahead. Thank you, Lucia. Yeah, thanks to both of you. I um, echo what has already said. I think what I'd like to add is um, that access means being able to belong uh, without carrying um, the burden of shame that is enforced by uh, social norms. And I think, well, I've been thinking about shame because I've been reading Brene Brown, the queen of shame, um, if anyone's familiar with her work, but um, it feels to me like uh, shame is a way of um, forcing people to assimilate, to conform, to exclude themselves from the room, um, as has already been said, and potentially to be excluded uh, through the physical space, um, as has already been said. So I feel like um, accessibility, accessibility means being able to um, experience belonging and to live um, free of that, that burden uh, of shame that comes from the norms uh, that are so powerfully enforced in our contemporary society. Thank you, Anita. I'm going to move on to Heidi for, for a final question. My personal definition of access is the presence and availability of all the structural conditions and also the technological and human assistance that I require in order to be able to do my work as an academic. For me, this means having a computer with a keyboard that has a keycard on it and text-to-speech software installed in it. Also, it means having an aide to assist me with personal care needs and to echo my speech in work settings. More broadly, it means having a reliable mode of transportation that will get me where I need to be when I need to be there. And finally, it means having sufficient flexibility in my workload to be able to accommodate the greater amount of time that I may require to accomplish a task compared to my non-disabled peers. I... Thank you, Heidi, and thank you all for those wonderful answers. There are a lot of themes here where, where you kind of have um, all discussed the physical and structural um, barriers to access, but also the, the community space and who's welcome, who's, who, who's welcomed into that space. And so moving on to our next question, um, how does ableism show up in our institutions? 
uh, I think we kind of want to hear about some of these overt ways, but also the covert ways that that ableism is present in our institutions and and the barriers to accessibility uh, in higher education. And so we'll we'll go with, be going with the same order. So um, feel free to kind of pick up from where each of each other's left off and respond to each other as well. Um, and and uh, I'll let uh, Mike start. Uh, okay. Um... I think you actually hinted on my answer. So uh, in terms of the explicit and implicit nature of uh, ableism in education and, and beyond, um, I have to say that most of my experience of ableism comes more from my interaction in the community than it does in education, because I think there is a little, uh, the, the thought about it is a little further ahead in, in many instances. Um, especially if you're in a department where they study that, you kind of uh, expect there's to be some understanding, but not not always. But it's that um, uh, the sort of this implicit nature that, and, and then when it's implicit and um, not known by those that harbor those um, beliefs, that's where the challenge has been the greatest. And it's very difficult um, to navigate that for, for I think, for students. Uh, and I think this comes out of, it's sort of a historical artifact of, of capitalism and religious um, historical, uh, uh, historical nature about sort of this hegemonic view of the body, the idealized body and mind. So um, it, it, as it relates to higher education, I think that uh, um, a lot of the, the, the focus even on what's available. I think, and I'm not sure if UBC has a disability studies uh, program, and they probably only have one or two courses at the most kind of thing. Yeah, so we're getting the nods of no. Um, 20 to 25% of the population has a disability yet. You know, um, so I think that's, I mean, those are numbers and that's one way of counting. And I'm, as the, I think I'm the most positivist of the group <laughs> um, that I, I kind of focus on those things. So um, I think that's that, that's where ableism has shown up in, in my um, my experience. Okay. Oh, I see. We're waiting. Okay. Lucia, uh, uh, go ahead. Um, I think, so I'll, I'll, I'll sort of pick up a couple of threads that I have been thinking about. Um, I think what I've encountered often in institutions is that there is a real denial of the fact that the institution is itself the barrier. The idea of higher education, the entire industries and histories of medicine and education that from from birth to high school to applying for faculty positions, stratify and have this, this what, it, what can only be described as eugenics, really, in terms of who it admits into the institution. Um, so there's that. But I also, I guess, connected to that, and I've been thinking about this a lot in terms of Black Lives Matter and policing and policing on campuses, that we can't, we can't see the policing of black bodies as separate from the policing of disability um, and the policing of black disabled folks in the institution. But I think something that the university doesn't want to talk about for obvious reasons is that we often think of police on campus as campus security or the RCMP, but that often it's administrators, faculty, staff, fellow students who also do that work of policing. And in terms of disability, that's what I've seen a lot. The, the requirements to provide a particular kind of documentation um, in a particular timely fashion, and that it's often time limited and that you have to keep reapplying. Um, so I think that the, the entire history of the institution is is steeped and built upon ableism rather than being this sort of isolated thing that somehow mysteriously we don't know how crept in. Um, so I do often 
really think about it as the institution is the barrier, especially if we're thinking about community engagement being a real selling point for institutions about who is that community that we want to engage and why. Thank you, Lucia. Lucia, that was beautifully said. Uh, I also want to stress that the academy by definition is an ableist academy and that comes out of its historical formation um, and in the Americas, it's colonial imposition. So it's ableist, it's masculinist, it's heterosexist, it's racist. And we have to keep that in mind. We have to keep in mind that um, our education system from, for children, for youth, and for uh, higher education is basically organized to enforce social norms. And so if those norms are ableist and masculinist and heterosexist and racist, those are the kind of youth that, um, and people that, that are going to be uh, brought into this university world. Um, and I think that absolutely has to be the found, you know, the foundation of the discussion um, because people carry these norms with them. So many people who have privilege aren't going to see and they're going to be um, ignorant of the experience of people who are all along the way excluded from belonging, right? And so our institutions absolutely must be called to account. Um, there's so much research demonstrating that at the university level, in order to address sexism, for instance, uh, which is one kind of barrier, um, it requires top-down leadership. It cannot be left to departments, you know, faculties, individuals. It must be mandated. And so given the fact that most um, PhDs uh, who go on to teach at universities have never even had any basic pedagogical training, right, let alone um, training and thinking about their student body, they're going to perpetuate um, these norms uh, related to what kinds of bodies belong, what kinds of minds are, are appropriate for education. Um, I just want to point out that the slogan for UBC where I teach for a while was a, a place of mind, right? And it doesn't mean all kinds of minds. It means one kind of mind disconnected from the social body. And I think many of us are able to remain ignorant of those factors. Um, and this is where we need leadership. But of course, we also need to take the initiative ourselves. I'm not saying individuals should just sit back, but we need to ask and force our leaders uh, to make decisions that are going to transform our institutions. Thank you, Juanita, and everyone else that's spoken so far. Um, Heidi, take us away. I think that ableism is ubiquitous in higher education. It shows up in the way that classrooms are designed based on an assumption that professors are non-disabled. It shows up in the fact that the prescriptive model for providing disability-related supports for post-secondary students remains basically unchanged from when I started university 35 years ago. Mm -hmm. And it shows up in the way that the academic promotion slash tenure system is rooted in a survival of the fittest paradigm, thus keeping disabled faculty marginalized and often ghettoized because it is often impossible for them to work within the same speed, space, and time constraints as their non-disabled colleagues. First and foremost, I'd say... Thank you, Heidi. All right. So, I think all four of you have, in, in answering that question, talked a lot about how ableism 
for the institution is, are so steeped in ableism and have been born out of ableist notions. And so I think my next question, kind of build off that, is what are the it's kind of delving into your own personal experiences beyond and being in part being part of institutions that um, are built out of these ideas what are some strategies you've employed to work around the barriers and, and what are those barriers that you've uh, experienced personally or maybe some some uh, some examples and we'll start with mike uh well i think i'll keep this one short uh, it's really, I, it's, you end up having to go to the source of the problem, whereas someone who's uh, not disabled may be able to um, find much easier ways around whatever that barrier might be. And uh, for example, where I live, um, the, the um, sidewalks and crosswalks of my, uh, of my city are um, not built for wheelchairs or really even for people walking around. And the option I, the, well, the initial ways of trying to address that were I try to contact the city to um, say, do this, do that. And uh, to me that what I've learned is that's probably a really bad approach. Um, so my second choice was to, okay, I actually joined um, the advisory panel that um, says yay or nay on developments. Um, Unfortunately, that wasn't successful because engineering department simply overrules all my um, comments, but it has worked in other situations. Uh, I, I've done that with the University of British Columbia, talking to the urban planning um, group for the, the campus. And so some things have moved there, but um, I would say success rate is, is low and it's, it's a learning process, uh, regardless of, of uh, what the problem is. Thank you, Mike. Lucia, go ahead. Um, so to answer this question, I'm going to provide a bit of context for it. So when I was at UBC and even afterwards, most of my activism and advocacy focused on sexual assault on campus. Um, and I think what was so important about the sexual assault movement, the, the, the anti-violence movement, is that it was largely students primarily students coming together and basically going public to, to point out the problems in the university. And that was the workaround of having to go to the media. Um, because I think what, in my experience, having helped the university try to figure out what its standalone policy was going to be, was that the ableism was always so evident in that there was this hyper-focus on prevention which assumes this, again, this sort of baseline, this ableist baseline, which presumes often that you know, people are able-bodied, that they're not chronically ill, that they haven't already experienced violence. So there was a disproportionate focus on that. And then on the other hand, this focus on individual like resilience. Um, so never actually addressing the fact that disabled students, faculty, staff, visitors are already at higher risk of being assaulted on campus. And that violence itself is disabling in multiple ways. And so the strategies that I've employed, I guess, have been to create solidarity with other, uh, with other survivors, uh, with other black folks, with other disabled folks. Um, and it's hard because I feel like sometimes the workarounds that I have found are they are, they're coping strategies and mechanisms that I profoundly resent having to have, that I don't want to have to work around. Um, and so the strategies are made so that I can survive the barriers, which, is, which for me feels different than a workaround or a, or a hack, um, like it's Ikea furniture or something. Um, so for me, the, the, the workarounds have been trying to make an appeal to not not shaming institutions but making sure that they're held accountable as much as i can but also community care and that it very much is this sort of underground movement of making sure that if i'm at a conference the people that i 
trust and know are there are going to be there to help me. Um, but often it feels very much like, like survival, not, not sort of thriving within an institution. Thank you, Lucia. I think that's a really important uh, point to make that when we, when we talk about the, the strategies that people have to use um, in spaces, their non-disabled folks do not have to do the same thing, put the same amount of work, time, or money um, to, to do the same amount of work. And so I think, yeah, that was a really important distinction to make. Thank you, Lucia. What yeah, thanks. Uh, I just want to follow up on Heidi's point about um, the pressures that faculty face, right, to be productive, the whole publish or perish model. This means that faculty are constantly looking for time-saving mechanisms in their teaching because it's the one place where they can cut, cut, cut because it's not as highly valued, right, in our productivity models. And so the reason that I'm saying this is that it means that although the university might have mechanisms in place uh, for students to register and receive accommodations from instructors, um, the accommodations are limited because the instructor writes an exam that is the same format no matter who's taking that exam. So even if you have two hours to take the exam, it's still the same exam. It's still the same assignment. So faculty are, I don't want to say reduced to, but we're, but so limited in capacity to be flexible, to have flexibility in our teaching. We have so much pressure to have 500 students and, you know, so, and I'm not, not saying this, this is a good thing. I'm saying this, like the pressures are just downloaded right from the top all the way down to the students. And so it makes it very difficult um, for students with different learning styles, with different kinds of needs, with different con contributions to actually be able to contribute. So in my smaller classes, um, I, I try really hard to create assignments, uh, like a variety of assignments so that people will find something that suits their learning styles um, and that allows them to really shine and to contribute. But there's limitations to that because I can do that in a small class. I can have flexibility. I can make, you know, changes. But in a large class, I think it becomes very, very difficult. And I, I am so grateful for um, the teaching assistants that I've had like Corin that, that help us try to find ways of creating um, or uh, yeah, to develop that capacity to be flexible, to think creatively, and again, allow people to contribute the things that they bring to the table, um, which again, um, I just want to go back to belonging. It's, it, it, you know, when you're in, a, in, in an, an academic environment, you want to be able to contribute. That's what you're there for. And everybody has something to bring to the table that we can all learn from. So we need to find the ways to do that. And I suppose if we're not getting the mandate from our um, administration, then I, I really call upon my fellow um, faculty to uh, think about ways that we can be more flexible and that we can welcome um, students to the table. Thank you, Anita. Heidi, go ahead. First and foremost, I'd say that from the time I started my undergrad program all the way through to my work as a prof, Probably the primary strategy that I have employed to work around barriers that non-disabled people do not face has been to build what I call organic networks of support among my peers and or community, rather than relying on the officially sanctioned disability support services to assist me with my day-to-day -day disability related support needs. Secondly, I don't know that I would call this a strategy per se as much as it is a general approach that I've taken to my academic career, but, in any case, when I was still a graduate student, early on in my career, I both realized, and came to terms with, the fact that, I would not follow what was, and is, 
considered to be the pattern of academic success, that is, the path which ultimately leads to tenure. Instead, I have built a multifaceted career which combines academic work with artistic work and advocacy work. I think that, in many ways, my decision to pursue a multifaceted career rather than solely an academic career has made it easier for me to compensate for the limitations which enduring ableist paradigms in academe have imposed on my academic career. Thank you, Heidi. That was a really powerful answer to this, this question. And I'm wondering if uh, any folks on the panel would like to respond to that. Um, and if not, we can move on, but I uh, wanted to take some time. Well, I, I, I really appreciate um, your comments, Heidi, and, and I, I do want us to honor that, that extra work that folks have to take on in order to be part of the, this institution. And again, just call upon uh, my peers, um, other faculty to, <laughs> to um, I, I, uh, to acknowledge the sanctioned ignorance with which we are privileged. I love the way you put that. I love the way you put that. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you. Um, sorry to put you folks on the spot, but I felt like it might have been a time for, for some uh, interpanel comments or conversation. Um, but moving on, building on that idea that um, oh, I had made a note, but um, Heidi had mentioned that, you know, in 35 years as part of the institution, she hasn't seen a lot change. Um, but that's a lot of time. And I'm wondering if, you know, have any of you, any of you have seen how institutions approaches to accessibility change throughout your experience as an advocate? Um, what have you seen that's been successful in driving change and what hasn't? And are there any underlying themes or factors that you think might uh, underlie? Um, I'll start with you. Sorry, you froze there. Did, am I up? Yes, so sorry. Okay. I did <laughs> question. Uh, uh, so I think what I would say about that is it, Again, I'm, if this is more from a community than an education standpoint, but that uh, I think some things are getting better, but the gap is increasing hmm. between um, groups. And I would also, I think, um, speaking to what Juanita was saying is, it's also disability groups that have not been helping their own case in many instances. Um, again, looking at it from an urban planning perspective that I come from, uh, we've got disability groups um, advising cities on things which they do not have the expertise in. And that ends up putting us further back because we have, it ends up being a failure. Um, it, and so I often talk about, and I think Corin, um, who's also a part of this, um, can attest to this, that uh, uh, we need qualified representation from the, from disability groups to, uh, and then that's not to say that we're now going to create a new subset of people, but there's things that I have expertise in and things that I don't have expertise in. I would never want to speak on anything related to culture and arts because I have zero expertise in that area. And there are times when you really need that expertise to help to move things forward. And I think that's one of the, um, one of the challenges that we have in making that, you know, making change is that we need to be part of the change and we have to be a good part of that change. Thank you, Mike. Lucia? Um, yeah, I, I think that's, I'm going to pick up on, on Mike's point. I was, my position at SFU for the past, I guess it was nine, nine months, was in urban studies. Um, I mean, I study culture and, and cultural studies, but I remember going to an event and they were talking about community consultations, which I've been a part of in terms of advising on policy. Um, but for me, the, the sort of, the sort of game changing moment was realizing how often the process of consultation from institutions, cities, whatever sort of governing body 
is often a process where they have something in mind already. So they like, we're going to build this park. What do you think about it? Rather than going into the community and saying, what are your needs in this particular space or your desires in this particular space? And so thinking about the ways in which we consult and have that be a collaborative process rather than when institutions, and I think universities are particularly bad at this, they already know what they want to do and they're looking for particular groups to sign off on it. And if that doesn't happen, then often they don't know what to do because their, their thought process going in is that this is a good idea. You know, we've got whatever the board of governors or whatever department that's willing to sign off on it. So I think the consultation process is still fundamentally broken because it, because it presumes that, you know, the, the model is not from the ground up. The model is still often from the top down. And that's where you have those moments um, where different groups are not agreeing, but the process has not been um, designed well. I think the design portion is, is important. Um, again, I, I sort of, I am still very sort of junior in my experience of higher education. And so I think part of my role as a junior scholar is also listening to people who have been in the institution um, and not, not, rep, not trying to redo work that's already been done, but listening to our elders and our mentors who have been doing this for 30, 40, however many years, um, and making sure that there's that intergenerational conversation. Because um, I think it's very easy for, for, for that work that has been done to be lost. I see you, Anita, you're nodding, so take it away. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I wanted to pick up on um, what Lucia was saying about the top down and bottom up since I, was, since I mentioned uh, that research has shown that uh, major changes are mandated from, from the top, but I didn't say prior to that, that those changes are demanded by the community, right? Um, and so one of the examples um, was a study at MIT that was mandated by women faculty to look at barriers to women. And once the administration had the empirical data and the president at that time was uh, an engineer, he said, <laughs> we're engineers, we fix things. They had the data, they mandated the changes. So I don't want to suggest that, you know, we need the powers that, you know, at large to tell us what to do, but we do need them to mandate um, changes that are perhaps already legal, legal things like the duty to accommodate is a legal mandate, but you wouldn't know that by looking at most faculties. Uh, or universities um, and the way that students are oftentimes treated. So yes, I, we need all of it, right? We need mobilization. Um, just to give an example, uh, when I started at UBC, uh, there weren't very many um, indigenous faculty and uh, we had a president come in, President Toop, and one of his strategies, again, strategies that are, um, elaborated through community participation. One of the strategies was to hire indigenous faculty. And the difference between when I started at UBC and when we had, it's still not very large, right? The um, First Nations and Indigenous Studies is, is amazing. Like the difference is amazing. Like it actually happened. Something actually happened. That doesn't mean there's no more room <laughs> for change, right? But my point is that it can happen, um, but we do have to have leadership and leadership has to be supported by communities and collaborative networks of people. I, I completely agree with that. Um, and uh, I would love to see um, our current president at UBC take on um, something that is, well, is being asked, which is that our community recognizes and acknowledges and, um, and is inclusive, right? That's our, those are our policies. So let's make it happen. Thank you, Anita. Heidi? 
My short answer to this question is, not nearly enough has changed. As I've already alluded to, the prescriptive model for providing disability-related supports for post-secondary students remains basically unchanged from when I started university 35 years ago. What's more, there are also approximately the same percentage of disabled people attending post-secondary institutions now, as there were 25 to 30 years ago, particularly at the graduate level. I think that there have always been, and continue to be, instances in which individuals with disabilities, sometimes along with their departments and or faculties, are successful in advocating for needed supports, and thereby driving change, at least in the short term. But, honestly, I really haven't seen a whole lot of enduring change in terms of identifying and dismantling the ableist paradigms and structures on which academia is built. Thank you, Heidi, and thank you all four of our, our panels for answering this question. Um, we're going to go on a break now for about five minutes, so uh, we'll come back at, at a, one o'clock. Sorry, I'm in a different time zone as well. Um, we'll, we'll maybe summarize what we've talked about in this last question before we kick off the Q&A. Um, but yes, we'll see you all in five minutes. And for attendees, feel free to read through the questions that have been posted, post your own now, um, or upvote uh, ones that have already been asked. Thank you, everyone. Thanks.
eight accessibility issues. Well, not me personally, but I only be pocketing half of it. No. Um, so changes are happening as we speak. Well, it's wonderful to hear. Congratulations, Mike. I think we can all collectively be really happy for you here in this space. <laughs> Amazing. Um, and I mean, I guess building off that before we launch into the Q&A, um, Heidi, Juanita, Lucia, uh, do you have any, any comments for, for our audience reflecting on the questions that we've had so far? All right. Okay, well, it sounds like we're ready to, to launch into our Q&A. Um, just briefly, I guess, oh, oh, thanks, Rachel. Sorry, Rachel sent me a, a message here, so I can stay on track. Um, but uh, briefly summarizing what we, what we talked about in the last question, um, it, you know, it sounds like the, what we need to see change to have enduring change, like Heidi said, is we need to look at dismantling um, the ableist structures within the institution before we will see any enduring change. Um, but in order to do that, bringing in what Lucia, Juanita, and Mike have said about collaborative work, um, intergenerational work, interdisciplinary communication and collaboration, um, I think we'll, we'll definitely get into some of that in the Q&A because we have some great questions, um, but it is hearing from, from experts with lived experience like yourselves, um, that, that students and our mixed audience are going to be able to continue hearing from and, and doing the same work and building off whatever all the folks here have done. So with that being said, I'm going to be reading out the questions uh, and then whoever would like to answer can uh, jump in. Well, we will start with um, this question here from an anonymous attendee uh, directed to anyone on the panel. They said, something I see repeatedly when students encounter barriers to access and belonging in university spaces is that university admins and often faculty then turn on the demand for access around, around and put all the work of designing accessible and welcoming spaces on the people asking for access. What avenues and possibilities exist for pressuring the university to compensate students and others for the substantial unpaid labor. Is this a pipe dream? <laughs> this is an enormous challenge. I don't wanna say that I have an answer, but it, I completely agree that it is something that must be addressed and uh, it's something I've been dealing with in, in, in our department, and I hope it's not a pipe dream. Um, I hope that we can find creative strategies when we lack institutional leadership. Um, and I think, yeah, having people um, being, t having advocates uh, that just keep on keeping on bugging um, people who are in places of privilege, privilege like myself, who can just keep on putting the pressure. I don't really know of any other way because we know it's not gonna just magically happen. I can share, can you hear me? Okay, great. Um, so I'll share a story and I do this in the interest of showing that it can be done in terms of keeping a university to account. So when I was invited to participate as an expert in the subject area and as a survivor on the sort of best practices for the standalone sexual assault policy at UBC, this was four years ago, I was invited and then I asked what kind of compensation there would be. And I was told sort of that I would have to wait and see. And I got a small amount and then when I had a meeting with President Ono, I handed him an invoice. I invoiced the president for my time. And I did put an explanation that this was also sort of a performative thing that I was trying to make a point. And eventually I was told after some conversation with third of the president's office that this was putting them in a difficult position. I was paid. And they never once said, we don't have the money which to me proved the point that there is money out there. And if that's not being taken into account when consultations are happening, 
I think often, you know, there's that people should just be glad to be at the table. People should just be glad to be there in consultations. Mm -hmm. And so if anyone out there listening right now needs help, um, sort of developing invoices or putting pressure on their universities, like I, I'm, act I'm very, very happy to help because I don't want it to be a, you know, a secret that I, that I received payment from the university, but I had to, I had to demand it. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that universities acknowledging and seeing that it's not just some lovely honor for us to be at the table, um, that but we need to, we, we need to, we need to pay people. I'm muted. Thank you, Lucia and uh, Juanita for answering that question. And Mike here, he's uh, gotten his, he's gotten paid over, the, over this time. Not, not in the same way, granted. Um, oh, that was a pun. Um, but uh, we're gonna move on to the next question. Thank you everyone for bearing with me, my God jokes. Um, here's a question from, from Hannah Facknitz here. And Mike had seen this over the break, uh, but feel free to answer again. She asks, how do we disabled folks define our success in an institution that is invested in our failure? How do we preserve our authentic selves and not sacrifice parts or all of ourselves to the ideals of higher education? Big question. Mm -hmm. I can take a stab at I can take a stab at this one. Um, I think a lot. I think a lot. Has to do with. Has to do with. Um, I just carving out. Uh, kind of carving out. Own space. Carving out our own space. What is often a very. In what is often a very. <coughs> Which is very often an inhospitable environment. Throughout my career, one of the things that has helped me survive is kind of. By passing. Bypassing. The official. The official organization and people. They were kind of tasked. Yeah. With the people that have been tasked with providing me support. That have been told to provide me support. We just rely on. And instead, I relied on. On you. The people around me. The people around me. Who knew me. Who knew me. No. For example, so for example, as an undergrad, as an undergrad, my first prof, my first prof, has a very matter of fact, had a very matter of fact way of trying to find out for me. Had a had a, very, had a very matter of fact approach to me. me okay. And asking me what is the best, what is the best way, way for you for you to write exam. For, for, for example. For example. The, the 
two of us figured out our own system. Which really pissed off. The disability students office. Especially when, when, subsequent profs when subsequent profs started to do the same thing. So, so I guess my general answer. So I guess my general answer. Whenever possible, whenever possible, recommend, recommend, circumvent the system. Do it your way or take the highway. Thank you, Heidi. Does anyone else on the panel have a have a follow up to that? That great answer. Yes, thank you so much for that, Heidi. I, I was thinking that a strategy that perhaps doesn't put too much undue burden could be to um, make sure that you do all of your assignments uh, in relation to issues that pertain or, or that pertain to accessibility and force your professors and TAs to learn something. Um, of course, I understand that sometimes um, when professors don't agree with perspectives, you might risk, you know, getting a better mark, but hopefully you have fair, <laughs> fair graders. Uh, but I think that kind of resistance, just kind of like saying like, you know, I'm just going to keep giving it to you um, is, is an interesting way. And I, as a faculty, I love, I love getting those kinds of papers and I love getting papers that are written from the perspective of people who have something to bring to the table and, and, and they do it in an academic way, right? With, with lots of sources and blah, blah, blah. We have all that available. It's not like we're lacking information on accessibility and disability. I mean, obviously we need more, but we have information. So um, I think that's, that's a fun way to, to kind of feel empowered um, if it's possible, depending on the class. Thank you, that's it to this question. And if not, we'll have one more Q&A before wrapping up that. Um, muted. So I have one more question here. Um, and so a few different people have kind of asked this question in the Q&A. Um, I'm going to read that out now. Do you have any advice for a student who is struggling to access higher education or, na or navigating higher education? How can we support one another? As Heidi mentioned, through organizing networks of care, as well as community care, that we as institutions how can we ensure staff, faculty, and workers? Was everyone able to hear the question? No. Okay. I will read it again. Do you have any advice for a student who is struggling accessing higher education or navigating higher education? How can we support e each other, as Heidi mentioned, through organizing networks of care, as well as through community care that Lucia brought up? As institutions resume research and work under the pandemic, how can we ensure access for students, mm. staff, faculty, and workers? Organic networks of care, sorry. That's what uh, it had meant to say there um, in regards to, I believe, Heidi's quote, but uh, anyone feel free to answer.
I think um, Carlton is doing, this is a little thing, um, but I'm not sure where they're at with it, but having a, a disability students um, organization within the, um, within the school is, is definitely a, a starting point for that so that they can be a, um, a, a point of communications and, and uh, resources for students um, beyond just the, you know, the accessibility and diversity um, resources that you usually get at most schools because they won't necessarily have the um, implicit knowledge that those that have, that are, have or are going through uh, the, the system will have. And uh, they may have, you know, hints and, and best practices that uh, you won't get anywhere else. I, I wanted to add something that responds also to another question uh, about um, taking disability studies out of this sort of niche. And I think, I think if, we, if, we, if we develop an understanding of how some of these um, exclusionary structures interlock or intersect, we can form coalitions that are a lot stronger um, than if we each think that we're dealing with something, you know, separately. And so a study of, of how power structures are, are interlocking or intersectional is quite illuminating, right? Because, I mean, racism is supported and underpinned by speciesism by um, ableism, uh, by sexism. Like we really, we can parse these things apart to, to really delve deep into each one, but we have to understand how they interlock. Um, and I feel really strongly that developing that kind of, of understanding will make our, our coalitions and our advocacy much, much stronger. Thank you, Anita. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's my I would, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I think I would just say that for me personally, I know that um, like technology has made it more possible for me through Twitter, I would say primarily mm -hmm. at the moment to find other, like when I didn't have other black or disabled scholars or black disabled scholars in my community to connect with, um, that Twitter has really, afforded me opportunities for coalition building, for solidarity, um, and just for not, you know, I think that there's, when I spend too much time in ableist academic spaces, I really start to question my own experiences. Mm. And just having people that I can share those experiences with and, and, and like remind myself that this isn't on, this isn't, I kind of cringe when I think about the UBC motto, which is like, it's up to you. Like, <laughs> well, can it be up to us? Can it be, can it be up to us communally? Um, and so just finding those other people um, and also people who aren't in academic spaces. I was thinking about what Heidi said about doing work in other disciplines and working outside of the academy and that practically speaking in terms of, you know, financial financial opportunities, but also just in terms of community. Heidi, that really resonated for me about making sure that we have other economic things that we can do, but also other communities. Yeah. Thank you, Lucia. It sounded like my cat had something to add there, but. Well, <laughs> uh, I think it sort of echoes that. Um, if we, the disability world has been so fractured for so long, and we have all these silos. We lack power when we um, do that, uh, it, whether it's trying to get funding for things um, or try to make our voices heard. And the more we can find shared experience and take that to the powers that be, I think the, the better off we are going to be. Like, I always talk about how um, you look at whether it's the LGBTQ community or green tourism, 
the bike lobby, they've done great. And it's so um, disproportionate off, in, in some cases to the population. They've done, they understand how to brand themselves. They understand um, what that shared experience is. We don't seem to do a very good job when it comes to that in the disability community, I, I don't think. Thank you, Mike. Heidi, anything to add? Um, I, I, I think that it's true. That the disability community <laughs> Thank you, Heidi. I think we're going to wrap up our Q&A there. Um, and with some themes from answering that last question of defiance uh, uh, as a way to, um, you know, circumvent the systems that, um, oh, the systems as in the institutions in higher education. Uh, I'm hearing that a lot from, from all of our panelists today. I want to thank all of you so much for joining us for speaking to us um, and to each other, uh, to have this conversation with uh, all of our participants who sat in today. Um, great. We're going to open up the chat for participants to leave their thank you. Um, and I'm really sorry that we can't get to everyone's questions. Um, I will be, we'll be checking with the speakers to see if they're keen to share their contact details with us um, in, in a follow-up email. And, Thank you to our ASL interpreters, our live captioner today, Elizabeth. Uh, and I'm going to be asking Corin, who is one of our organizers, 
to turn on their camera and invite you all to our next panel, which is going to be a week from today. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Amanda, for your incredible moderating. Um, you did a brilliant job. Um, this conversation was amazing. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you again to our interpreters and closed captioners. Um, and also, if I can get Rachel to quickly... There's Rachel. Um, I want to also uh, thank Rachel. Rachel um, was not just behind the Zoom settings, um, but also is behind this webinar series more generally. Um, and as the one who got the ball rolling and got us all um, together. So um, thanks to all of you. Thank you also to our sponsors one more time, U-Town, Creating Accessible Neighborhoods, and um, the UBC Geography, Equity, and Diversity Committee. Um, you helped us to uh, make this accessible. Um, it's because of their support that uh, we were able to um, compensate these wonderful presenters for their time, something we talked about, um, that extra work that people have to put in to do the education, um, and also um, for closed captioning and also for ASL. Um, so you've made this, uh, you've made access possible. Really appreciate that. So um, the last thing is that we will be having the final and second and final part of this uh, webinar discussion next Friday at 6 p.m. Pacific, um, not at noon, at 6 p.m., so a different time, but still on Friday. And uh, Rachel has just put the Eventbrite link to next week's webinar in the chat. Please go there, please register, please send it to all your friends, all the cool kids will be there. Um, and next week's theme is on, um, oh, brain fart. I know it. <laughs> Wait, nope, it's back. It's gone. It's back, but I wrote it down. Um, next week's theme is opportunities for change. So we started to get into that a little bit today, but that's what we'll be doing next week. So I hope to see everyone there and thank you again. Bye.